Today we're learning how to play GKR Heavy Hitters. I'm Mark Maya. Welcome to Board Game Coffee. All right, now before we get down to some serious learning, let's get down to some serious subscribing. See that little logo in the bottom right hand side of your screen? If you don't, you're probably watching this on your phone, but that's okay. Just look around for a subscribe button. Give it a little tippy tap and you'll be instantly subscribed to our channel. It's the best way to keep up with our weekly videos and a great help for us. And as always, if you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. Now, let the lesson commence. GKR Heavy Hitters is a televised, advertised-driven combat sport put on by mega corporations to fight for salvation rights to the abandoned cities of Earth. You take on the role of a pilot in command of your very own team of giant killer robots. And the better you perform, the better rewards you'll get from your corporate sponsors. There are two roads to victory in Heavy Hitters. Either be the first to demolish four buildings, or take out your opponent's Heavy Hitter. Although, in a 3-4 to four player game, if you take out a heavy hitter, it's the player with the most points at the end of the game that wins. Regardless of who took down the heavy hitter. So don't go blowing each other up willy-nilly. Last thing you want to do is give the win to the player that's been cowering in the corner the whole game while you're out there doing all the work. You know who you are. Now, before we get started, I'd like to let you know that all our How to Play videos are broken up into chapters for your convenience. So, if you want to skip to a certain section of this How to Play, just click the timestamp in the index located in the description of this video. Let's get to the setup. Now you might have noticed that the game board has two sides. Your standard side and then this other side. For your first game, place the standard side face up. It's the side that looks like this. Now we need to build up our city layout. In the back of the rule book, you'll see example layouts designed for specific player counts. The player count for each layout is listed here at the top. For this example, we're going to be using the first four player layout listed in the back of the book. So you're going to be placing buildings on the board according to this layout. But before you do that, you're going to need to assemble those buildings. To assemble a building, simply grab one of the flat building faces and fold it so that it fits nicely into the building base. Once you got that, just cap it off with a building top and voila, you got yourself a building. Oh, and here's a little tip. When assembling the buildings, make sure these wedges on the top of the cap run parallel to the building's base. Now, let's get back to that layout. If you find it tricky to see exactly which space a building is supposed to go on, you can always reference the hex code running across the top of each layout. Each of these codes pertain to a matching code printed on each hex. Now, you might have noticed that not all the buildings are the same size. This is purely aesthetic. The size of the buildings has no bearing on the gameplay at all, so feel free to use whichever buildings you want. For the next part of the setup, we're going to need to figure out which player will be going first. This player will be referred to as the Glory Hound. Each player rolls two dice. The player with the highest roll takes this adorable little puppy dog and places it somewhere in front of them, clearly visible by all players. The roll of the Glory Hound will change hands throughout the game, and this little red dog acts as a reminder. Good puppy. Now. Starting with the Glory Hound and going clockwise, each player takes a turn selecting their heavy hitter. This will determine which faction they are playing for. Once everyone has a team selected, each player should collect all the parts that matches the color of their chosen faction. Three support units, three support unit cards, 20 hollow boards, all the pilot cards in your color, and 59 faction cards also in your color. Now that everyone has their faction-specific items, each player will also need one heavy hitter dashboard, one energy track token, which goes right here, three upgrade tiles, and one reference card. That's a lot of stuff. Now lay out your side of the board so it looks something like this. 
Let's start with your faction board and work around that. Place your reference card here. Your pilot card, once you select a pilot, can go here. Place your three upgrade tiles here, black side up in this order. Take your three support unit cards and place them here for easy reference. I recommend laying them out in this order. Combat support unit, repair support unit, reconnaissance support unit. It'll come in handy later, trust me. Now, place your hollow board somewhere where it's easy to reach. If you're anything like me, you'll be dipping into this pile quite a bit. Because I'm a building tagging machine. <laughs> and your deck, once you build it, will go here in this area labeled Online Systems. Ah, ah, not so fast. I said once your deck is built. Now, although you get all these faction cards, you don't get to play with all of them. Out of these 59 faction cards, you're going to make a deck of 25. But we'll get to that shortly. The player with the Glory Hound, aka the first player, will place their Glory Hound where everyone can see it. Now, let's place the shared items. Your achievement board goes here. Your sponsored cards here, next to the achievement board. And the dice in easy reach of all players. Last thing we need to place on this board are a few heavy hitters. But hold on. You can't just go placing giant robots wherever you want. There are rules. See these areas marked on your layout page? These are the areas where heavy hitters can be deployed at the start of the game. Starting with the Glory Hound and going clockwise around the table, each player takes turns placing their heavy hitters in one of the indicated spaces. At this point, you'll only be placing your heavy hitters. Your smaller support units only get deployed during gameplay. Now, you're going to need someone to pilot these awesome robots. Starting with the player who placed their heavy hitter last and working your way counterclockwise around the table, each player selects a pilot card in their color. Every pilot has its own unique ability, so choose wisely. The pilots you don't choose can go back in the box. You won't be using those anymore. Once a pilot has been chosen, the same pilot cannot be chosen by any other player. So you can't have more than one Isabella Torres in play. Each player then takes the matching token for the pilot they've chosen and places it at the start of the track on the achievement board. And finally, let's build that faction deck. Each faction has a stack of 59 cards, which they can use to make a 25 card deck. Let's briefly go over the different card types. Primary and secondary weapons are the weapons your heavy hitters use in combat. Deploy cards allow you to deploy your support units for two energy rather than their normal four energy. Reaction cards are your defensive cards. You'll be using these to improve your odds of avoiding an attack. Orbital Strike is a simple damage dealing ability that can hit anything on the board, regardless of line of sight. Maneuver cards allow you to move outside your move phase. And although your support unit cards do look like the rest of your faction cards, they do not count as part of your faction deck. So you can just leave them where we set them up at the start. Okay, back to deck making. Your deck represents your heavy hitters systems and hit points. First thing we need to do is reduce this stack of 59 cards to a deck of 25. First, you're gonna need to select a primary weapon. You'll notice you'll have four sets to choose from and each set is made up of five identical cards. Select one primary weapon set, no mixy matchy, and stick the rest back in the box. This is the start of your faction deck. Now, pull out your secondary weapons. You'll have five sets to choose from, and each set contains four cards. Choose any two sets of secondary weapons, and place them in your deck. You'll also add five deploy cards. No choices here, just take them all and include them in your deck. Now, if my math is right, you should have about 18 cards in your faction deck which means you're gonna need seven more to fill up that deck. Grab your Orbital Strike, Maneuver and Reaction cards, and choose seven of these to fill out your deck. And unlike your weapon cards, you can choose the remaining seven in any combination you like. You don't have to take full sets. For this example, I'm gonna take two Orbital Strikes, three Reaction cards, and two Maneuver cards.
Once that's done, you should have exactly 25 cards in your faction deck. Now you can shuffle them up and place them on your dashboard. And while you're there, make sure your energy tracker is set to 5. Now that your deck is set, draw a hand of 6 faction cards. Now, if you don't like your starting hand, you can reboot your system by putting the 6 cards back in your deck, shuffling them, and then drawing a new 6. Now you only get to do that once, and only at the start of the game. After that, no more do-overs. Before we start play, there are a few reoccurring rules I'd like to bring to your attention. Once you use a faction card from your hand, it goes here, into the offline systems area of your dashboard. Only actions taken by your heavy hitter cost energy. This includes deploying your support units. All players get 5 energy to spend in a round. If you spend more than that, and your energy marker dips into the minuses, then your heavy hitter takes damage. And each time your heavy hitter takes damage, you lose a card and place it face down in your damage system area. These cards can either come from your hand, your faction deck, or any combination of the two. Energy is very important in this game, so use it wisely. All cards have bold print here that tells you when they can be played. Whenever you repair a heavy hitter with your repair unit, choose a card from your damage system, any card you want, and place it face up in your discard pile. Heavy hitter's gameplay is separated into five phases. Deploy, move, combat, tagging, and reset. The deploy phase is when players get a chance to deploy their support units. Each player can only deploy one unit per round, but can choose from any of the units they have available. It costs four energy to deploy a support unit. But if you play a deploy card, you can deploy a support unit for the low, low cost of two energy. When deployed, your support unit can be placed up to a maximum of two spaces away from your heavy hitter. And remember, if you did use a deploy card, place it face up in your discard pile. Now let's go over the rules of movement. During your movement phase, you're going to get a chance to move all your robots, although they don't all follow the same rules of movement. So first, let's start with your heavy hitter. When your heavy hitter moves, pay one energy for each space it moves onto, although you don't have to move at all if you don't want to. When moving, your heavy hitter can move through its own units, but can't stop on them. And although they can't move through enemy units, they are allowed to stop on the smaller enemy support units, kicking them out of the way and into an adjacent space. When this happens, the opponent whose robot you displaced chooses which adjacent space the support unit is moved to. Oh, and your heavy hitter can't move through or stop on buildings, regardless if the buildings are destroyed or intact. Once your heavy hitter has stopped moving, select its facing. A heavy hitter's facing will determine its firing arc, but we'll go over firing arcs a little later in the lesson. Okay, so that's it for heavy hitter movement. Your support units work a little different. First of all, support units do not cost energy to move. Instead, they can move up to the maximum amount displayed on their information card, right here in the move section. Your support units can also move through spaces occupied by members of its own faction, but cannot move through spaces occupied by the enemy faction. And unlike their big brother, your little support units cannot stop on any occupied spaces regardless of who or what is on it. Nor can they pass through buildings. Well, the recon unit can. This little guy can actually fly over units and buildings like they were empty spaces, although he can't stop on them. Now that you understand how movement works, you're ready to head into the movement phase. During the movement phase, each player will take turns moving their robots in order. Starting with the glory hound, each player takes a turn moving their heavy hitter. Once you move your heavy hitter, remember to deduct the energy for every space it moved onto. Move two spaces, lose two energy. But be careful when moving. 
you might want to save some of that energy for the battle. And if you overspend, you will take damage. And you won't be able to move your heavy hitter again until the next movement phase, so choose wisely. As I mentioned earlier, once you've moved your heavy hitter, you get to choose its facing. These three colored sides here denote which direction your heavy hitter is facing. Facing has a huge impact on what targets you can hit during battle, but we'll get to that a little later. Now, it's the next player's turn to do the same thing. Move their heavy hitter, choose its facing, and deduct the appropriate amount of energy. Go around the table clockwise until each player has had a chance to move their heavy hitter. If a player decides they don't want to move their heavy hitter, they can still choose its facing for free. It won't cost any energy to do so. Now that everybody's had a chance to move their heavy hitters, let's move our support units. Now on your first turn, you won't actually have any support units to move. So let's play a little game of pretend. Let's pretend that we're a few rounds into the game and all players have already deployed a few of their support units. When moving our support units, we once again start with our glory hound and move our way clockwise around the table. But you can't just move any support unit you want. Support units have to be moved in a particular order. Your combat unit, your repair unit, and lastly, your recon unit. Now, remember back during the setup I said to place your support unit cards in a particular order? This is why. Laying out your support units in this way makes it easy to remember their movement order. Life hack. So first up is the combat unit. Starting with the glory hound and moving clockwise around the table, everyone gets a chance to move their combat unit. Not just any unit, specifically their combat unit. If you don't want to move your combat unit, or simply don't have one to move, you can pass. Once everyone with a combat unit has had a chance to move it, we continue to the repair unit. Once again, starting with the glory hound and going around the table. And once that's done, go around the table one last time so everyone gets a chance to move the recon unit. The only way you can move outside of the movement phase is by playing a maneuver card or by playing a sponsor card that gives you the ability to do so. Now for the phase you've all been waiting for, the combat phase. But first, a lesson in weapon handling and safety. If you want to blow things up, you're going to need to know how to work your blower uppers, aka your weapon cards. This number here represents the speed of your weapon. The higher the number, the faster the weapon. Faster weapons, fire first. The symbol beside it represents the type of weapon it is. In this case, an energy weapon. This number is how much energy it'll cost to fire this bad boy. The range here tells you how many spaces away this weapon can fire. And this is the maximum possible damage that this weapon can inflict. Any additional abilities that this weapon might have will be described here. Your support unit cards are similar, but not exactly the same. For one thing, unlike your heavy hitter, once you pay energy to deploy your support unit, you don't need energy to use any of their other functions. Each support unit has its own weapon speed, weapon type, weapon range, and damage value, just like your heavy hitter's weapon cards. What's different are the hit points, which track how much damage your support unit has taken. Unlike your weapons, which are discarded after a single use, your support units stick around until they take lethal damage. Each point of damage taken reduces their hit points by one. This defense of six means that they prevent one damage for every six they roll on a white die, unlike heavy hitters that defend on a five or a six. But this can be improved later. They also have a move value. This is how many spaces that support unit can move during the move phase. Moving your support unit does not cost any energy. And also, any special abilities that your support unit might have will be described here. Oh, and this little line of sight number down here at the bottom is used for spotting, but we'll explain how that works a little later. Who's ready to declare some attacks? I know I am. During the combat phase, all players at the same time select which weapons they want to attack with and place them face down in front of them. When you're selecting a weapon, Take note of its energy cost, range, and any cover your target might have. 
Because if you can't afford it, you don't get to use it. If you can afford it and your energy dips into the negatives on your energy track, you'll take damage. And if you don't got range or line of sight on your target, you're not going to have a shot to take. Where was I? Ah, right. Select the weapons you want to attack and place them face down in front of you. This is your firing line. You're allowed to have multiple weapons in your firing line, but you're not allowed to have two weapons with the same name. Also, in your firing line, include the cards for any support unit that you have on the board. They get to attack too. Once everyone has finished playing their weapon cards face down in their firing line, flip over all the face down weapons to reveal your attacks. And regardless if you can use it or not, once a weapon card is flipped up, you're paying its energy cost. Support units in your firing line do not cost energy to use. You already paid for those when you deployed them. So deduct the total energy used from your energy meter. And remember to take damage for every point of energy you use beyond your initial five. And don't stress about taking damage because you use too much energy. I do it all the time. I am a very aggressive player. And yes, I, I lose a lot. Now that everyone has got all their cards turned face up, each player sorts their own firing line in order from fastest firing weapon to slowest. And don't forget to include the support units you have deployed. Once everyone has sorted out their firing lines, resolve attacks in order from fastest to slowest. When comparing weapon speeds, remember that you're comparing all weapons on the table. In combat, there is no glory hound goes first business. It's all about the speed of your weapons. In this example, Blue Team would fire with their Shoot and Scoot Recon Unit because it has the fastest weapon speed amongst all the weapons in every firing line at 846. Followed by the Orange Team with their Dire Laser at 624 and so on. When attacking with a weapon, all attacks originate from your heavy hitter. When attacking with a support unit, all attacks originate from that support unit. Now, you know who gets to attack and when, but who are they attacking? Targets are only selected when it's that weapon or support unit's turn to attack, according to the weapon speed order. When selecting a target for your heavy hitter's weapon, you have to select a target within your firing arc. Your heavy hitter's firing arc is denoted by these three colored sides. Anything within this area in front of them is considered to be in their firing arc. Support units are not limited to a firing arc and have a full 360 degree range for targeting. Okay, so your target is in your firing arc, but are they in your line of sight? Line of sight in heavy hitters isn't always a straight line. To see if you have a line of sight on your target, simply count the spaces from the robot you're firing with to your intended target using the shortest path available. If there's only one shortest path to your target, and there's a building along that path, then you do not have line of sight. If there's no building along any of the shortest paths leading to your target, because it's quite possible that there will be more than one, then you have a clear line of sight. Oh, and other robots do not block your line of sight, no matter who they belong to. Once you've established that you have a line of sight on your target, you gotta figure out if they're in range of your weapon. In this example, our weapon's range is from one to three. So as long as the target is within three spaces from whatever is firing at it, you've got range. Okay, you got the target in your sights. It's time to attack. When attacking your target, roll two black dice. No matter what weapons or support units you are attacking with, you always roll two black dice. To successfully hit a heavy hitter, you'll need to roll a total of five or more. Anything less than that is a miss. But to hit the smaller, more nimble support units, you'll need to roll a total of seven or more. If you're lucky enough to roll double sixes when attacking, that's considered a critical hit and your target takes the full damage of your weapon with no chance to roll a defense. On the other hand, if you're unlucky and you roll double ones, 
then you've got yourself a critical failure. Which means you don't only miss, but your weapon explodes in your hand and is automatically tossed face down into the damaged system pile. Ouch. If you got a card that lets you re-roll your dice, now would be the time. Once you've attacked with a weapon, that weapon is immediately removed from your firing line and placed face up in your discard pile. Unless it says otherwise, like your orbital strike weapon that states, place into the damage pile after use. But if for some reason the weapon you played doesn't get used, maybe you no longer have a legal target for that weapon, or your opponent did something to affect your weapon systems. If that's the case, then the weapon goes back into your hand. But you don't get the energy back that you spent on it. After a support unit attacks, its card just goes back to where it came from. Support unit cards never go into the discard pile. That covers all the basics of attacking, but there's more to attacking than just standing toe to toe and rolling dice. While you're in combat, you might come across a few situations that will impact the result of your attack, either in your favor or not. What kind of situations? Glad you asked. We kind of already covered this in our line of sight segment. If you don't have line of sight on a target, it's considered to be in full cover. And if you can't see it, you can't hit it. Well, unless you have a spotter or an orbital strike handy, eh, more on that later. Ah, partial cover, the next best thing to full cover. Remember when I said, if the shortest path to your target passes through a building, you can't see it, and hence it has full cover? In this example, there are three paths tied for the shortest to the target. Each path passes over three spaces. But if even one of those paths crosses over a building, your target has partial cover. Oh, but to get partial cover, they need to be adjacent to the building that's in your path. So if they were here, not adjacent to the building, they would not have partial cover. I know what you're thinking. So what? They have partial cover. What does that even mean? If your target has partial cover from your attack, then the roll required to hit them is increased by one. So in the case of a heavy hitter, you would need to roll a six or more on your black dice to land a successful hit instead of the usual five. If your target was a support unit with partial cover, then you would need to roll an eight or more instead of the usual seven. Spotting is a way for your support units to help your heavy hitters get at those cowardly robots hiding in full cover behind the buildings. Remember that little line of sight number located at the bottom of your support unit card? That's your support unit's line of sight. It shows you how far they can see when spotting for your heavy hitter. But what is spotting? If you're faced with a target that's behind full cover, you can still land a successful attack. But you're going to need a little help from your friends. And some missiles. If you're in a situation like this, where your target is in full cover of your attack, but you have a support unit with line of sight on that target, then your heavy hitter can fire its missiles at the target, ignoring all cover. The enemy doesn't even get partial cover. It's like the building isn't even there. Good job, little guy. But spotting only works with missile-based weapons. You can tell if a weapon is missile-based if it has this icon in the upper left. Keep in mind that the missile attack is still coming from your heavy hitter, so you still need to be within range, and the target needs to be within your firing arc. No firing backwards, no matter how many eyes you have on that target. The alley shot is probably one of my favorite tactics. It's a great way to get a shot on your opponent without them being able to retaliate. To pull off an alley shot, first you're gonna need an alley. When two buildings are adjacent like this, they form an alley down the middle. To shoot through this alley, you'll need to have your shooter adjacent to both buildings and looking down through the middle. Because you're firing through an alley, your firing arc is narrowed to this area. When checking range for an alley attack, make sure to count the space occupied by the buildings. And because this is such a tricky shot, the roll required to hit your target is increased by two. So you'll need to roll a seven instead of a five to hit a heavy hitter. 
and a 9 instead of a 7 to hit a support unit. So yes, it does make it harder to hit your target, but on the bright side, you're in full cover and they can't shoot back. Unless they have a spotter, or an orbital strike, or if they're standing right on the other side of the alley. But other than that, you're safe. Ah yes, flanking. The sneakiest of sneak attacks. Actually, if you flank someone with an alley shot, that would be the sneakiest. In heavy hitters, a flank attack is when you attack a heavy hitter from behind. A heavy hitter's flank is basically the opposite of their firing arc. The bonus of attacking an enemy from their flank means you need to roll one less on your attack dice for a successful hit. So instead of needing to roll a 5 on the attack dice, you only need to roll a 4 for your attack to be successful. But you can't flank a support unit since they don't have a flank, because they can see 360 degrees at all times. Alright, now you know how to dish it out. But can you take it? When either a heavy hitter or a support unit is the target of a successful attack, they get to roll the white dice to defend. The defending player rolls a number of white dice equal to the damage being dealt. In this example, the weapon being used hits for 7 damage. So the defending player gets to roll 7 white dice one for each damage dealt. By default, your heavy hitter's armor is at five. That means for every five or six you roll on a white die, you prevent one damage. So in this example, the defending player blocks five hits and takes two damage. When a support unit is attacked, they also roll white dice to defend. But since their default armor is six, as denoted on their card, they need to roll sixes on a white dice for each hit they want to defend. So your heavy hitter took a few hits. Now what? Well, I'm going to tell you. For every damage your heavy hitter didn't prevent, place one card face down in the damaged system pile. These cards can either come from your hand, your online systems, or a combination of both. But if you do take a card from your online systems, you don't get to see what the card is before you place it in the damage pile. After it's there, you can look at it all you want, but no takebacks. Once it's in the damage pile, it stays there. Unless, of course, you repair. If you ever need a card from your draw pile and you find you don't have any, shuffle your discard pile, not your damage pile, and place it face down in your online systems. This is your new draw deck. If, while losing cards due to damage, you find yourself with no cards in hand, deck, or discard pile, then start tossing weapon cards from your firing line. Not your support units. They are not part of the 25 faction cards that make up your deck. Although, if all 25 of your faction cards end up in your damaged system pile, your heavy hitter is toast. Support units are a little more straightforward when it comes to tracking their damage. Each support unit has a hit point tracker on their card. Each time they take a point of damage, slide this little clip down the track for every point of damage they take. As soon as they take lethal damage, remove their figure from the board and place it back on the side lines next to their card. A support unit that has been destroyed can always be brought back during the deployment phase by paying its energy cost as normal. Now that the battle is resolved and the smoke is cleared, we move on to the tagging phase. Tagging is the part of the game where you get to put these little smiley faces into the slots at the top of the buildings. These smiley faces represent advertising billboards for your sponsors. Why is that good? Well, first of all, you get a sponsor card, which gives you all kinds of cool abilities to play with. And if you manage to get four tags on a single building before anyone else, you get to demolish that building. And remember, demolish four buildings, and you win. Instantly. Tagging is done in turn order, with the Glory Hound tagging all possible buildings first. Then, moving on to the next player to do the same. Each robot a player has on the board, heavy hitter, and support, can each tag any one building they are adjacent to. Facing doesn't matter, 
but they can only tag the side of the building that they are touching. No reach arounds. If one of your robots is adjacent to two buildings at a time, they can only tag one of those buildings, not both. You can even replace one of your opponent's smiley faces, aka hollow boards, with one of your own. That'll show them. These are sponsor cards. You earn them by tagging buildings, and they allow you to do all kinds of cool stuff, like hack an opponent's system to drain their energy, overload their weapons so they don't fire, or deploy a support unit for free. The list goes on. For each different building you tag during this tagging phase, you pull a sponsor card from the top of the sponsored deck. Note that you get one sponsor card per building tagged, not per tag on a building. You can tag one building three times, but you'll only get one sponsor card for doing it. You can only ever have five sponsor cards in your hand. If by the end of the tagging phase you have more, discard down to five. Sponsor cards do not go into your discard pile. When you discard a sponsor card for whatever reason, either because you played it or you had too many cards in your hand, discard it face up to a pile next to the sponsor deck. Now, this part is very important, so pay close attention. Sponsor cards do not count toward your maximum hand size of six faction cards. They're a set on their own with their own hand limit of five sponsor cards which means at the start of your turn, you can be holding six faction cards and five sponsor cards. And since sponsor cards do not count as faction cards, you can't discard them for damage. When you run out of sponsor cards, simply shuffle the stack of discarded sponsor cards and place them face down. Voila, new sponsor deck. As mentioned before, if you're the first to demolish four buildings, you win. Once you've placed your fourth hollow board on a building, that building is demolished. Remove the building from its base and place one of your tags in the resulting rubble. These tags cannot be over tagged. They are simply there to track which team did the demolishing. Demolished buildings don't supply any cover, but you still have to maneuver around them as normal. The reset phase is the last of the phases. This is the part where you uh, reset and get ready for the next round. The first thing you're gonna reset is your energy back to five. Next, draw back up to six faction cards. If you currently have more than six faction cards in hand, then discard down to six. Cards discarded this way go into your discard pile. Remember, sponsor cards don't count toward your faction card hand size. And lastly, before I move on, we need to figure out who the new Glory Hound is for the next round. The Glory Hound goes to the player who tagged the most buildings in the last tagging phase. If there was a tie, the Glory Hound goes to the player seated closest to the current Glory Hound in turn order. If the current Glory Hound is involved in the tie, they do not count and cannot keep the Glory Hound. And that's all of it. That's the game. Oh wait, what's this? This is the achievement board. Each time you perform one of the achievements listed at the bottom of the board, you get one achievement point and progress up one space along the track. Let's break down those achievements for you. If you become the Glory Hound during the reset phase, you earn one achievement point. And I mean specifically during the reset phase, not any other time, because that can happen with the use of a sponsor card. If you pull off a successful alley shot or flank attack on an opponent, you also get an achievement point. If you demolish a building, you get one achievement point. And if you still have three support units on the board at the end of the combat phase, you've also earned yourself one achievement point. And the best part is you can do each of these achievements as many times as you want, even on the same turn. Although, once you reach the end, you're done. No more achievement points for you. Now, see these spaces here with the little happy faces? Each time your pilot reaches one of these spaces, you unlock an upgrade associated with that space. 
Each upgrade has the same number of happy faces on it as the space, so it's easy to tell which one you've unlocked. But what are upgrades? As they are black side face up, these upgrade tokens simply indicate the current state of your abilities. When you unlock an upgrade for that ability, flip it to its gray side. Your first upgrade makes it easier to hit a support unit. So now you score a hit on a roll of six or more instead of seven. The second upgrade increases your support unit's armor by one. So now they can defend on five or six, just like a heavy hitter. Unlock the last upgrade and you'll hit a heavy hitter on a combat roll of four instead of five. Someone's gonna get a hurt real bad. So how does it all end? How does one win heavy hitters? Well, there's two ways. Once a heavy hitter is destroyed, that signals the end of the game. Players will continue to play out the current combat phase, but once that's done, the game is over, and the player with the most points at the end wins. Points are determined by how far a player is on the achievement track. Each step on the track is worth one point. They also get one point for each card they have remaining in their draw and discard piles. Not their destroyed systems, not their support units, and definitely not any sponsor cards. If there's a tie, the player who's furthest along the achievement track wins. If there's still a tie, the player with the most tags on undemolished buildings wins. Or if the entire group agrees, you can just keep playing until only one heavy hitter is left standing. And as mentioned before, demolish four buildings and you win. And that's it. That is all of it. If you like this video and you want to see more, subscribe here. If you want to see more videos right now, click here. I'm Mark Maya, and this is Board Game Coffee. And remember, have fun, keep gaming, be social. See you next week.